Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tia Teriak, and I'm very happy to welcome you to What's Up Doc, a monthly lecture series brought to you by the Concord Hospital Trust. We'd like to recognize the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of our What's Up Doc programming. The Walker Lecture Series was established in 1892 through a bequest in the will of Concord native Abigail Walker. We encourage you to check out their website at walkerlecture.org for information regarding their schedule of free performances held at the Concord City Auditorium. What's up, Doc? It's so very proud today to have Dr. Patrick Mangus with us as our special <coughs> guest speaker. Dr. Mangus is from the Concord Hospital Cardiovascular Institute. He serves as medical director for the cardiac, cardiac catheterization lab and structural heart program. Dr. Mangus attended medical school at the University Hospital of the West Indies. He completed his residency at Columbia University College of Physicians. <clears throat> And Dr. Mangus also completed fellowships at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. Dr. Mangus holds board certifications in cardiovascular disease, interventional cardiology, nuclear cardiology. He is a registered uh, physician in vascular interpretation and holds a certification from the National Board of Echocardiography. Dr. Mangus joined the Concord Hospital staff in 2015, and today his presentation is about the TAVAR procedure, which is something you're really going to want to know about in case you're ever advised that you need to replace your aortic valve. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mangus. Great. Thank you, Tia. Uh, and I uh, just want to thank the uh, Concord Hospital Trust for inviting me to do this presentation. I think it's, it's very important um, for uh, everyone in the community to be aware of what aortic stenosis is because it's not a, it's not a very common, commonly heard term. It's not a very commonly understood disease process, but it is a very common disease process and I think it's important to get more information about it. So the goal of our presentation today is to review the anatomy of the heart valves just to get a better idea of where things are and what they do, review the signs and symptoms of aortic stenosis, discuss some of the uh, steps in evaluation and diagnosis of aortic stenosis, and to review the, some of the treatment options, and in particular, review the transcap with aortic valve replacement procedure or the tablet procedure. So let's start with what the heart valves are. So on the right side of the heart, Blood comes from your body, all your organs, and we get transported from the right atrium across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle and then through the pulmonic valve to your lungs. Your lungs then gets rid of all the carbon dioxide and gets oxygen into your blood. And then that oxygenated blood that we all need to move and feel good and think straight that blood comes back into your left ventricle here, goes through your mitral valve, and then goes into the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart. From the left ventricle, the blood gets pumped through your aortic valve to the rest of your body. So this left ventricle is what we call the main pumping chamber of the heart, and the aortic valve is that one-way valve that makes sure that blood goes out of the heart to your body so you can be active. And this is the valve that we're going to focus on today, the aortic valve, okay? So what is aortic stenosis? Aortic stenosis is a buildup of calcium deposit on the aortic valve, and it causes the valve to be narrowed and it reduces flow to the rest of your body. The normal aortic valve kind of looks like a Mercedes Benz sign when you're looking down at it from above, okay? And the healthy valve, have three leaflets, one, two, three, and they sort of open up in the center. So when the heart pumps, blood comes through this nice big opening and goes to the rest of your body. But over time, for a number of reasons we'll get into a little later, there's a buildup of calcium 
on the leaflets of the plant. Some, sometimes it looks kind of nodular, like little lumps. And you can imagine if the valve is trying to open, it's not going to work very well if it's weighed down by all this built-up calcium. And sometimes the calcium actually fuses the leaflets of the valve together so that when it opens, the opening is significantly less than it should be. And you can imagine if that there's less blood getting from the pumping chamber of your heart through this opening, people are not going to feel well. And ultimately, the heart is going to be under a lot more strain than it should be. And this is important to understand. So what are the causes and risk factors for irritable stenosis? As I mentioned earlier, calcium buildup uh, is one cause. About 1% of the general population actually has a congenital abnormality in the aortic valve, something called a bicuspid aortic valve. So that's very common, 1% of everybody. And we find that in the valves that we replace, almost 40% of those valves, even in patients as old as 80 or 90 years old, we find that they have a congenital abnormal valve that has been silent for many, many years until it comes time to replace the valve. Patients with a history of rheumatic fever, particularly in childhood, uh, causes the valve to get damaged. And patients, we find patients who have had radiation therapy, radiation can harm the valve, and at a certain point in time, we need that valve replaced. Risk factors include increase in age, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, history of smoking, or family history of uh, aortic disease as well as difficulties from the valve as mentioned earlier. Aortic stenosis is a progressive disease. And here, from left to right, you can see a healthy valve. And as time goes by, the buildup of more and more calcium deposits on the leaflet, and the opening of the valve gets less and less. And so we grade aortic stenosis from mild all the way to severe. And so as we get worse, the opening gets less. So what are the symptoms of aortic stenosis? So this is kind of what the valve looks like if you went to surgery and they took the valve out, that's what they would see. So this is not a healthy looking valve. So patients can have fatigue, shortness of breath, chest pain. I've had patients tell me that they get an ache in their chest that's kind of a low line baseline ache and suddenly when you replace the valve, it's gone. Uh, that's, you're not gonna find that in a textbook. I've never read that in a textbook, but this is one of the things that I've, I've come to learn the more and more we do these procedures, that there are symptoms, and sometimes very vague, very unusual, but if you take your time and listen to your patient, you'll actually learn something that you didn't, didn't know before, and that's important. Walking short distances, become difficult, you can get rapid heart rates. You can imagine that if the heart needs to get more blood out, if it's pumping blood to a smaller hole, it has to pump faster to get the same amount of blood out, depending on how much blood you need. <coughs> Patients can have swollen ankles and feet. Folks can also feel depressed, feel like not engaging in activities they used to enjoy. And part of that has to do with lack of energy and this concept that, oh, I'm, as you get older, I just slow down. When in reality, we realize that almost 40% of patients um, um, sort of don't understand that when you say you're not having these typical symptoms of chest pain or shortness of breath and you just sort of feel fatigue, what could be going on it could be your aortic valve. So how serious a disorder is this? So patients who develop symptoms, once you have severe aortic stenosis, there's a 50% chance of dying within the first two years once you start to have symptoms of aortic stenosis. And the symptoms we just reviewed. So although it's not a disease process that we hear a lot about, you can certainly see that it's important to recognize that unless you're diagnosed and you have appropriate treatment, 
the outcome uh, is pretty severe. Who's at risk for getting aortic stenosis? So everybody in this room, as long as you have an aortic valve, you're at risk of getting aortic stenosis. And we know that as the population ages, the incidence of aortic stenosis or the prevalence goes up. Uh, in the United States, uh, there are about two and a half million people over the age of 75 have aortic stenosis. <clears throat> the estimated prevalence is about 12% in patients over the age of 75. And as you can see, the year over year, decade over decade, the proportion of the population over um, age 75 uh, continues to increase. And as we see this increase in the older population, we will see, continue to see an increase in the aortic stenosis and the need to take care of, of patients with aortic stenosis. As I said earlier, aortic stenosis is progressive and once diagnosed, we require routine follow-up. How do we diagnose aortic stenosis? So physical examination and the history um, is important. When you listen, your chest with a stethoscope, you can hear an abnormal heart sound called a murmur, and that can clue your primary care doctor or your cardiologist into the fact that there may be something wrong with one of the heart valves. And once you, they hear this abnormality, the next step would be ordering a echocardiogram, which is a heart ultrasound, that gives you relatively reliable uh, information about the anatomy of the valve and how the leaflets of the valve are moving. Once you're diagnosed with aortic stenosis, uh, even in the mild stage, uh, as we said, it's, it's progressive, so that requires periodic examination and at least repeat echocardiograms every year. Um, once aortic stenosis is in a severe range, uh, most cardiologists will really recommend aortic valve replacement. Once you have symptoms of aortic valve, this, sorry, this slide gives you more information about once you have severe aortic stenosis, once you develop symptoms, and once treatment is recommended, that is aortic valve replacement, the occurrence of patients dying between recommendation of treatment and getting treatment if treatment is not obtained goes up to almost 11% in six months. So let's say you were diagnosed with aortic stenosis, treatment was recommended, and there is a delay in treatment. This indicates that the further delayed treatment, the higher the risk of a bad outcome if not treated promptly and appropriately. <coughs> the importance of aortic stenosis and the importance of the TAVR procedure was highlighted in the recent guideline recommendation from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. And today's guidelines reflect the latest low-risk approval with recommendations to focus on age and shared decision-making rather than risk. When TAVR procedure was first approved almost 10 years ago, it was approved for patients who could not undergo surgery or patients who were high risk of surgery. As the technology has gotten better and as we have done more procedures and more clinical trials, we have demonstrated that not only is the TAVR procedure safe and effective, and the valve is also durable, there's also benefit to intermediate and even low-risk patients. And so across the spectrum of patients with aortic stenosis, the TAVR procedure needs to be a consideration. So this is sort of represented in this, and this is a hard slide to see, but it's sort of represented in this diagram here. 
but over the age of 80. And as long as we expect, uh, or if your your expected life expectancy is less than 10 years, and you have symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, in order to reduce the risk of premature death and to improve your functional capacity, TAVA would be recommended. For patients who are younger, who have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, the decision between TAVA, which is a transgastric procedure, and SABA, which is surgical aortic valve replacement, has to be a decision made with uh, discussing um, a patient's um, values and a patient's preference um, with regard to what sort of procedure they want to undergo. And so last year, the guidelines emphasized that we use the risk scoring to eliminate patients who would not do well with surgery. And all of the patients, we really focus on the age as a risk factor, and we focus on the patient's preference um, and their uh, own values in having a, a team approach-based uh, discussion to really identify what best would serve each patient on an individual basis. <coughs> When you're diagnosed with aortic stenosis, what are we looking for every time you come in through the office and we do a, an echocardiogram every year? We know that over time, aortic stenosis does progress. And over many years of looking at this, we have a very good idea of the rate at which aortic stenosis will progress. So once mild aortic stenosis is present, the associated parameters that we look at is measuring the velocity, how fast the blood is flowing through this narrowed opening. We also know that over time, there's an annual increase in the amount of pressure that the heart has to pump against. And we also know reliably over time that we can expect a decrease in the valve area or the area of that opening over time. <clears throat> so, this is usually very um, consistent, although we do have patients who progress rapidly, and we feel that those patients who progress rapidly really represent the subset of patients who develop symptoms, and once symptoms develop, we really need to act quickly in terms of replacing or treating their valve. There's a unique subset of patients that uh, we struggle to, to manage who have severe aortic stenosis and their gradients or the pressure across their valve for one reason or another is not as high as we would expect. So sometimes if we diagnose a patient with severe aortic stenosis, um, it's hard for us to say definitively what's going on and sometimes we do additional testing. And so if you're diagnosed with aortic stenosis and your cardiologist says, well, I'm not really sure it's really severe, sometimes we do additional testing, such as something called a, a stress echocardiogram with a, a, a drug called robutamine, and that will help to tell us truly is this severe aortic stenosis or not. And so sometimes uh, additional testing is required. Now, how do you get diagnosed? We talked about echocardiography, um, <coughs> ultrasound that uses sound waves to take an image of the heart and helps us to closely examine the aortic valve. The auscultation, which is listening to your heart with a stethoscope, it allows us to hear the sounds of a murmur. And I have two things here, I'm not sure if they'll play. But, no, so. I don't think, um, yeah, do you think the audio can, the audio option? Uh, no, that's okay. okay. I had uh, two audio clips of what the regular, normal heart sound sounds like, and then one with what aortic stenosis sounds like. But um, after the after the, the talk, if you guys want to come around, I can I can show you on my computer. You can hear hear the difference. 
um, so you can kind of know what we're listening for when we have this button still from your chest. Uh, sometimes we do electrocardiography cardi with ECG, uh, chest X-ray, and cardiac catheterization where um, it's a more invasive test where we actually take you to the cath lab and we inject our IV paltras, take your um, heart, look at your blood vessels, and we'll also take measurements with catheters across your aortic valve to get a better assessment of the pressures. So what are the treatments for severe aortic stenosis? So aortic stenosis is a mechanical problem. And as such, there's really no good medical solution. There is no medicine that we know of that would help aortic stenosis. There have been studies looking at different kinds of uh, antihypertensive or blood pressure lowering drugs. There have been studies looking at different kinds of oils, different kinds of cholesterol lowering drugs, um, but uh, none of these have really shown any impact on reducing the progression or improving symptoms of aortic stenosis. That being said, patients who do develop symptomatic aortic stenosis and have symptoms of heart failure on that basis, sometimes we treat those patients with medications to help relieve the symptoms, but the medications themselves really have no impact on aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis is a mechanical problem and requires a mechanical solution. Um, we do offer a balloon aortic vasculoplasty where we put a balloon in the heart and we inflate the balloon to open up the valve. At this point in time, that procedure is what we describe as a, a palliative procedure. It's really done for patients who, uh, for one reason or another, would not be candidates for surgery or TAVR at a particular point in time. Maybe they're admitted to the hospital with some other life-threatening issue and were subsequently found to also have severe aortic stenosis. We would do a balloon vasculoplasty to open up the valve temporarily to allow them to have other procedures done to allow them to get better from other illnesses with a view towards bringing them back to be more definitive in treatment later on. The two major treatment options for aortic stenosis would be surgical aortic valve replacement, so-called SABR, or transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR. Okay? Treatment itself should be a priority, and as I said, the only effective treatment for severe aortic stenosis to have the valve replaced. When the time comes to make a decision about replacing the valve, the decision is really a team-based approach in collaboration with not only the patient and the cardiologist, but also the patient's primary referring physician who will refer the patient to the valve clinic. In the valve clinic, the patient will be evaluated by uh, one of the general cardiologists or one of the interventional cardiologists, at which time, based on whatever testing has been done so far, usually an echocardiogram, additional testing would be completed, and that would involve cardiac catheterization to look at the blood vessels around the heart and do additional pressure measurements. We also do special CAT scans to understand what size valve someone would need. We also use the CAT scan to figure out any variations in heart anatomy that would add challenges to the procedure. And we use it to figure out how big the blood vessels are in the chest, abdomen, and legs to ensure that when we decide if we are moving ahead with a catheter-based procedure, we understand your access and make sure your blood vessels are large enough for catheters to go into the heart. Once all this testing is complete, there's a multidisciplinary review and a final decision by the heart team. So what the heart team is, is a group of cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, heart surgeons, and um, imagers who meet, we meet every week to review 
all patients who are considered candidates for any valve procedure that we do. We review all the information that we gather. We review uh, talking with, with, with each person who's seen the patient and met with the patient to get a better understanding of what their desires are, what their values are, and then make an ultimate decision about recommending surgery versus versus talent. Okay. Once that treatment recommendation is, is made, this is reviewed with the patient and the patient's family to ensure that everyone is on the same page and we're meeting expectations. So it's a collaborative process and at the center of the collaboration is the patient and the patient's family. So the options for irritant valve replacements. A surgical irritant valve replacement requires uh, opening of the chest, taking out the old valve, and sewing the new valve in place. So it's a little bit more involved, requires uh, you could have a, a, a heart lung machine and uh, requires multiple days in the hospital afterwards and some amount of, of rehab after due to, due to how involved it is. The transcatheter procedure, the approach we most use is pouring in through the artery at the top of the leg. Uh, and so usually that's the difference between surgery and the travel is the access site. Uh, surgical approach can be uh, open heart, as we said, and some, some uh, centers offer a more minimally invasive approach. It does require a heart lung machine where the disease valve is completely removed and a new valve sewn into place. Uh, folks are usually in the hospital for a little bit uh, longer, usually about uh, five to six days. Uh, and surgery lasts on average four hours. Uh, the rate of, of stroke uh, or death is about uh, you know one to three percent every year, depending on the on the risk of, of patients. The transcatheter valve replacement is uh, less invasive, and it's uh, what we call a catheter-based uh, technique. Uh, your heart is still beating. We insert a new valve within their diseased valve. Uh, folks usually go home 80% uh, of the time the next day, and the vast majority uh, the day after that. Uh, on average, the procedure lasts about an hour, and the rate of uh, complications about 1% uh, in terms of stroke or death at, at one year. So who are thyroid patients? So thyroid patients are patients with severe symptomatic irritant stenosis who may have other disease processes or other issues with their health. History of stroke, they may have prior heart surgery, uh, history of atrial fibrillation, uh, prior open chest surgery for one reason or another. Uh, they may be, tend to be frailer, older, they may have more vascular disease, um, more uh, issues with diabetes, uh, kidney problems, prior chest radiation, or heavily calcified aortas, which would make surgery very difficult. So it ranges from otherwise healthy uh, 65 to 70 year olds to patients with lots, lots of issues that we, we have to uh, deal with, but certainly not everything that we're not used to dealing with. So, uh, who are thyroid patients? So this is a, a good slide that sort of shows you anywhere from a healthy, active, 72-year-old woman with really not very much issues going on, apart from her irritant stenosis. Uh, she wants to stay active, um, good candidate for child. Okay, An older man uh, with heart failure symptoms, uh, some frailty issues, more health issues, so blood pressure, diabetes, uh, previous heart attacks with stents. Uh, so also a patient who uh, we see uh, quite frequently. And you know, patients who are older, 88 years old, 
We've had patients, uh, we have a 97 year old woman that we, we did who just turned 100 this year. And she came into the office and said, why do I have to keep coming back? I'm young, but it's not <laughs> but, but, you know, again, it just represents that, you know, not every, not every 60 year old is as healthy as a 90 year old. And, and so, so each patient has to be taken on their own, uh, on their own value and what, what, uh, what they, uh, what they feel is important to them. So the, the sheer decision making, but the face of TAVR is, is a multi. So, one of the biggest benefits of TAVR is helping to get patients back home sooner. So, on average, with, um, with TAVR, overall, stay in the hospital is about three days. Here at Concord Hospital, I think our average is about one and a half days, okay? Uh, majority of the patients get discharged to home as opposed to discharged to a rehab facility. And there's significantly less rehospitalization coming back into the hospital after you get discharged. Um, so that's, that's lower. And the other important aspect of TAVR is that patients feel better right away. Okay? And so, so I think that's one of the, the important aspects to keep in mind. So I said earlier that we usually go through the leg, uh, but patients can have multiple issues that make it very difficult for us to go through the leg. Sometimes their vessels are all blocked up. Uh, we have ways of dealing with that, but if we can't get up through the leg, sometimes we have to go uh, through blood vessels in the arm, through the aorta itself. Sometimes we can actually go through the apex of the heart. So different ways of getting a new valve in, but there's always a way of getting a valve in without actually opening up, opening up the chest itself. So you know, we're used to dealing with what we would call alternate access for patients who need a tablet valve who can't get one the traditional way. The valve we use 100% of the time here is this uh, safety and valve, this is what it looks like. It has a, a metal uh, frame that's made of uh, uh, chromium and cap, uh, cobalt. And then the, inside the frame, there's a bovine or cow pericardial tissue valve that's sewed in. And there's this skirt uh, that helps to seal the valve in place once it's inside your aorta, right? So a lot of people ask, well, you know, is it a pig valve or a cow valve? It's, it's a cow valve, okay? And this is what it looks like. It's a little bit smaller, we put it inside. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so we have four size valves, and it ranges anywhere from a 20 millimeter valve to a 29 millimeter valve, and that, that just represents the variation in patients that we treat from yeah, yeah. Um, 70 pound little old men to uh, 400 pound bulking, um, you know, retired football player. Uh, but uh, so everybody needs a different size valve, and we usually can get a valve that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions along the way, feel free to stop and ask the question. I'm happy to answer. So this is a just a, a animation of what what the procedure looks like, um, just uh, to give you an idea. Uh, usually we get access. So this is a. a cartoon animation of the balloon going into the heart heart. Here's a wire in the valve in the heart. And then the heart looks like it's it's sort of quivering because we're rapidly pacing it in order to inflate the balloon. And once uh, once we balloon the old valve open, we now put this is the valve delivery system that's going in. 
once the valve delivery system is in your aorta, we actually load the balloon and pull it into the valve. And this design really helped the company to make the profile of the system smaller so that we can treat patients with smaller blood vessels. So once the valve is loaded on the balloon, we position it through the diseased valve, and everything is done over a wire so we don't poke any holes in the heart. So once the valve, we think the valve is in a good position, we'll make some minor adjustments, either higher or lower, just to make sure we like the position of the valve. And then once we're happy with the position of the valve, we'll start to pace the heart quickly. So here we're just kind of adjusting where the valve is. So we pace the heart quickly, the balloon inflates, the valve is on the balloon. We'll deflate the balloon, stop pacing the heart, and then we'll pull the delivery system out. A new valve stays in place. And patients often ask, well, how does it stay in place? If the surgeons have to sew a new valve in, how does this stay in place? So it stays in place utilizing your old valve as sort of a calcified structure to hold the old valve and the new valve in place. So, so you use your old valve, old valve as, a, as a landing zone, and that keeps your new valve from moving. Can you push all that calcification right. down to the, and what cap does that break off? What is the right, so that's a good question. So that's, when we do that, um, when we do that CT scan, one of the things we're looking for is to make sure the floor of your aorta, right around where your valve sits, you have to make sure that the space is adequate and the coronary arteries that come off above your aortic valve, you have to make sure they are high enough above the valve so that when we push those old leaflets out of the way, those leaflets don't block your blood vessels and they have a nice place to sort of hang out indefinitely. So, so that's some of the information we look at when we do when we do our initial testing is to make sure that when we when we do this valve, there's enough space for your old leaflets to be displaced and they won't cause any trouble. That's also one of the source sources <coughs> of we say about one percent of patients who have to have a will have a stroke. And so there's that stroke risk. Part of that is because we balloon that old valve, we push Remember we said there was calcium there, nodule and calcium on the valve. When we break some of that stuff off, you know, sometimes a little speck of calcium or a little uh, a plaque can uh, go to the brain and cause a stroke. But that's very, very unusual. And as we said, it occurs about 1% of the time. Um, and in terms of strokes, at the time of the procedure, that that risk is actually very, very low. Okay, so even though it seems like a very sort of uncontrolled way of ballooning things out, uh, the impact is not as 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 significant as we think. Yes. As I watch you kind of do that procedure, is that the biggest risk? Is that the place where something, the key place where something can go wrong? Yeah. Or so other places where something. Can absolutely. Go wrong? So, so believe it or not. The most frequent complications from these procedures actually have nothing to do with the heart. And in fact, have most to do with vascular access. So where we put that sheath in the leg, um, that's, that's your biggest risk of uh, uh, bleeding, uh, getting, um, uh, sometimes you can rupture blood vessels in the, in the leg, uh, and and so and so that's that's your biggest risk, and that risk is is a lot less now than it was ten years ago. Ten years ago, uh, it's hard for me to 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 put this in perspective. Ten years ago, when we first started doing Tyler, the size of the tubes we put in um, was was almost um, seventy five percent bigger than what we're using now. And so 
patients had to have bigger blood vessels in order to get the equipment up. Uh, now, somebody with a, a blood vessel of five and a half millimeters in diameter, we can get equipment up to that blood vessel, as opposed to uh, 10 years ago, you needed a damage of almost eight millimeters to get the equipment to go where it needed. So with the combination of improvements in the techniques that we've used in terms of access and closure, and improvement in the design of the equipment, uh, the risk of vascular injury has significantly decreased, but it still remains the most significant and most common risk when undergoing one of these procedures, which is why we're very um, uh, cautious in how we image folks and how we uh, get access and close uh, in these cases because we understand that this risk is the highest risk and we want to make sure that uh, you get a good valve and you don't have any limitations now that you have an issue with when we have access. Good question. Other, yes? Do we access the, do we have to access the heart through the apex of the heart? Yes. Do you have to put stitches where you go in or does it automatically close? Good question. We do have to put the stitch in. So that, so all these cases are done. Whenever we do a case, there are uh, the interventional cardiologists in the room, and there are also the heart surgeons in the room. So we do all these cases together. Okay, and depending on the access site we use, the level of involvement of each person varies. When we do the case from the apex, the heart surgeon would would do uh, what we call a cut down to get to the apex of the heart, they would put a little stitch in, what's called a purse string suture, where you put a, put a stitch around where you're going to put the, um, the sheath, and then you're able to put the sheath in, do the case, and when we take the sheath out, they pull on the suture and it sort of cinches down that spot where we went to. So we do have to put the stitch in to make sure that there's no bleeding out. Yes. Because my sister had it done that way, and I was just too nervous. Yep, yep. And, 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 um, and you know, it's, it's surprising that the heart stays beating in spite of what we're doing and, and all the manipulation that we, we're doing. Um, and patients, patients do well. Uh, the uh, patients do well also based on access points. So uh, the patients who do the best are the patients we're able to get a new valve in through the leg, okay? Uh, when we have to use an alternate access site, uh, patients don't do as well, and I think that's partly to do with the fact that if you, if you don't have good blood vessels, there's probably other issues going on that increase your risk overall. When you're working and you've inserted this, yes. how do you see what you're doing? So. <laughs> When we are, so that cartoon that we watched was just a cartoon animation. This is what we're actually seeing in the cath lab when we're working. So once we have access in, and we, um, so I'll walk through what each thing is. So here's the delivery system. It goes over the arch and comes down here, okay? This wire is called a temporary pacing wire, and that goes in through a vein in the leg and that goes into the right of the heart and allows us to increase the rate of uh, beating of the heart to the point where it's kind of quivering so that when we're ready to deploy the valve, the valve is kind of bouncing in and out, okay? So we're looking with x-rays and this is what we're seeing. Um, so here, we're pacing the heart. We do an injection to understand so that was an injection of IV contrast, so we know exactly where the valve is. Once we're happy with where the valve is, we inflate the balloon to deploy the valve. Then we deflate the balloon. And we turn the pacer off. And then take the delivery system out. So that's what we're seeing, okay? Which is very different from what the heart surgeon sees. The heart surgeon doing an open procedure, they're, they're looking directly 
Captain Bowers. So they have they have a lot better view than we do. So this is um, like a live X-ray. That's what's right. Going on. Live X-ray. Yeah. And so because because we can only because this is all we can see. All the testing, the echocardiograms and the CAT scans and all the stuff we do ahead of time, allows us to understand exactly where things are in relation to the, the valve. And so even though even though we're only seeing an x-ray picture, we know from all the prep work that we've done where everything is. We know the size of the valve, so we know how high it is. So there's a lot of information that we were able to, to translate to this picture so that we can understand what's going on and make sure when we deploy the valve, it's in the right place. Um, This is not unlike the procedure you would use when you're inserting stents in the heart. It's similar, but um, similar in some ways, but a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when inserting stents, where the equipment is a lot smaller, mm -hmm. and it's it's on a much smaller scale. So if you remember that first picture I showed you with the heart valves, so the heart valves are big structures inside the heart. When we insert stents, the stents are going in the very small arteries that are on the surface of the heart. So the, the, the valves that we put in are, um, you know, um, 20, 20 to, to 30 uh, millimeters, the valves. For the stents, we're talking about anywhere from two and a half to three and a half millimeters. So one tenth the size. So we're working on a much smaller scale with the, with the arteries. But, but the concepts are very similar in terms of catheters and so on. If a person has been stented prior to this procedure, yep. does that present any problems in doing no. this procedure? No. That actually leads to my question. I saw there were a lot of different things that were uh, risk factors yes. for aortic stenosis. So, um, yes and no. So, um, having congenital abnormality of the aortic valve increases the risk of aortic stenosis. <coughs> having coronary artery disease does not necessarily in and of itself increase your risk of aortic stenosis. Uh, they do coexist and they do share some pathophysiologic similarities, but are not necessarily risk factors. <coughs> Not sure that was helpful. It was. Okay. So another subset of patients that we see are patients who have had valve surgery in the past, and their surgical valve is now failing. Uh, when you've had a, a bioprosthetic valve, <coughs> they last anywhere from 10 to 14 years. And so you can imagine if somebody's in their 60s or 70s and they've had valve surgery, um, you know, 10, 15 years later, they're still alive, they're still active, they want to stay active, but they're limited because the surgical valve starts, not, uh, starts to fail. And so, and so TAVR is, is again uh, approved for treatment of failing um, aortic or mitral bioprosthetic valves. Um, and the overall procedure is exactly the same as treating a, a native uh, disease valve uh, in terms of options for access sites and so on. Uh, so, <coughs> so at Concord Hospital, this is, I think this was a case we did earlier this week. This is just kind of what the room looks like. And uh, so uh, usually we have two operators uh, for interventional cardiologists and then a heart surgeon and uh, a scrub tech that helps. <coughs> and up at the head of the bed, you have an anesthesiologist or one of our, our cath lab nurses um, uh, that help um, to facilitate the procedure. 95% uh, of the procedures that are done here, patients are actually awake. 
so um, yeah, actually, you know, uh, uh, the majority of patients don't remember when they fall asleep because it's not nothing so. <laughs> Uh, not for them, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but when we first started to do, doing the procedure um, four years ago, all cases were done with general anesthesia. So you were on a breathing machine and, and you, were, you were asleep. And then as we got uh, better at doing it, more efficient at doing it, when we realized that uh, having patients awake, having them able to interact with us uh, is probably safer for the patient. and um, gets the patient up and out of bed quickly. And I think we think patients do much better if they're not on the general anesthesia for these procedures. So so 90 95% of the folks are awake. Mm -hmm. They do well. Sorry? Use some sedation. We do use some sedation. Yeah. And it's variable how much sedation. Some some folks need a little, some need a lot. And again, it's we have um, we transitioned over the last year to what's called nurse-led sedation, where we we don't have an anesthesiologist in the room. We have one of our nurses who is at the head of the bed, speaking with the patient, gauging how comfortable or not comfortable the patient is, communicating with us so that we can give more medication to make the patient more comfortable, more sleepy if they need to be. Um, but at the end, I think I think they have a good experience um, and we're able to be awake right away after we're done with the procedure. I'm assuming it doesn't hurt. So no, so they, they actually, the, the biggest source of discomfort <coughs> is when we actually get access and when we're putting the big, when we're actually putting the valve in because the, it actually, even, even though majority of folks have big enough blood vessels, there is some amount of stretch that happens on the arteries. And we, there's, there, there's really no good medication we can give you to make you not feel that, that stretch. And so that's, folks will get a little bit uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, um, when we're doing things inside the heart, folks don't feel too much, okay? When we do that, that rapid pacing that makes the heart quiver, uh, some people will feel a little bit lightheaded, but the vast majority of folks sort of don't feel too much. Okay. You mentioned the multidisciplinary team and you're talking about all of these cases. I mean, this seems much more, much less invasive, better recovery. What would what would push the patient to a surgical approach you know, other than just you know preference? But assuming that the patient too wouldn't or shouldn't be just on. Yeah, so um, patients who have, so there are patients who have, uh, who, who would otherwise be good candidates for TAMR, but they have other issues that need to be treated. So patients who have severe irritant stenosis, but they also have really bad blockages in the blood vessels around the heart that would necessitate bypass surgery at the same time, okay? Um, there are patients who may be a little bit younger who would prefer a mechanical valve because the longevity of a mechanical valve makes it last longer than a baroprocessive valve. Um, and um, and there, there are patients who, who uh, again, on the younger side, who would, would we feel that would generally do, do better with surgery and timer um, just because uh, once you start getting younger, the decision about what valve to put in becomes more complicated because you anticipate at some point in the future the need for another procedure or another valve. And so we have to weigh uh, those, those risks. Can the cathode valve become, can the calcium? Yeah, so, so can, can your tamper valve fail? Yeah, yeah. So what is the mic? So what we what we know so far for the for the valve that we use, we have we have good data that eight years the valve lasts eight years, and the reason I say we have good data that the valve lasts eight years is because 
when you first started putting the valves in, uh, really sick, really old people um, when it was first approved because there were patients who were inoperable or very high risk. And so a lot of the initial data, the patients didn't live 10 or 20 years after. So we don't know how long the valves really last. But we have good reassuring data that the that it does last at least eight years. And we are pretty confident that, that it, it is probably comparable to the surgical valves. Um, but, but we don't have the data yet. Yeah, we've done we've done folks in their fifties, um, patients who've had prior chest radiation, uh, who've had uh, what, what's called a radiation uh, valvopathy, so damage to the valve from radiation from prior cancer, and so we've done younger patients, and the reason there are better candidates for this procedure is because if you have your chest irradiated, having to open up your chest to do an open procedure, the risk of complications are much higher. It's what we call a hostile chest. Uh, so so surgery would be would be would be really high risk. Risk of the sternotomy not healing and so on. Just uh, you mentioned that back to my other question about the X ray, live X ray yes. imagery going on. Uh, what about the safety of all the people in the room exposed to that day after day? Yeah, so we're, it's hard to see, but on the wrong list, we, we're wearing lead. Oh. We have, we have uh, leaded goggles, we have thyroid shields, we have an entire vest and apron down to the knee with, with uh, 25 millimeter thickness lead. And we have, this is all regulated, we, so we have monitors on our, on our uh, lead aprons, we keep track of radiation exposure over time. Mm. So yes, so that is, the, the purpose of this talk is to give you guys information about the ethics of nurses, but another thing is that there, this is, you know, for in terms of workplace, you know, when we work in the cath room and do these procedures, there, there is a risk of radiation exposure to us doing this every day. The risk to a patient is, is very low, because uh, you're only in there once. So yeah, we do monitor that, but it's, it, is, it is something that we, we, we always uh, we're very strict about folks in the room. How many procedures do you do a year? <laughs> so we started the program in 2017. So quarter over quarter, this has been our growth. Uh, uh, so so we've been. We've been growing our program over the last four years, and I think, you know, certainly with with, with the pandemic and so on, we there's certain limitations, uh, but uh, but our hope is that we can continue to grow because we, we feel that there are lots of patients who, who need this this therapy, and uh, and we don't you know we, we want to make sure we have it available to offer everyone in our community because uh, we think it's we think it's important. It's one of the it's one of the, you know, one of the things that we do that, that literally has a clear mortality benefit. People live longer when we do this. People feel better when we do this. And so this is one of the most rewarding uh, things that, that we do uh, in cardiology. Uh, this, is, this is some of our teams. So this is, when we say, a team approach. These are all some of the people involved um, from the valve clinic coordinator, Luke Rasheed, who's here with us. Uh, scheduling, interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, cath lab nurses and technologists, our imaging specialists that read and review the CTs, the Cardiovascular Institute clinic staff that assists with scheduling and follow up, and area and cath lab recovery staff, and all the nurses that are in the different areas of the hospital that interact with all, all these patients. Um, and another way of framing all those people 
And it's with a woman down there, um, and, I mean, and, and this way where it, there are all these folks who are interacting, but at the center is always the patient and what, what's best for the patient and how we can make sure we have a, a good result. Um, these are some resources that are available um, if um, any more information, want more information on therapeutic stenosis um, in general. Um, so these are some good resources um, available. <coughs> and um, <laughs> any questions <laughs> or comments? Thank you. Any other questions here for Dr. Marengas? Sure. What is the follow-up treatment? Yeah, so um, we see everyone one week after to make sure the access site is still there. Everyone at one month with a repeat heart ultrasound to make sure the valve continues to work well at six months and then yearly after that. One month, six months, and then a year to follow. After that, it's a year. We follow up an echo every year because we want to know how long the valve is going to last. Yep. Okay, yep. and and we yes, <laughs> and um, and uh, we, you know so and if if the, if there's evidence that there are issues with the valve, depending on what the issues are, there are different ways of addressing it. Um, and so so that's the reason for routine uh, continued follow up. Any other questions? Any questions? Oh, oh, sorry. So uh, you talked about the things that, you know, diabetes, hypertension, yeah. everything. For a healthy person, what should we be doing to avoid having to get to the point of stenosis? Right. So the best thing that a healthy person can do is to stay healthy. <laughs> meaning, meaning you, you, there, we don't know that there's anything you can do to prevent heretic stenosis. Okay? And so the best thing you can do is stay active, have a healthy diet, maintain a healthy weight, and keep yourself from getting other issues that would put you in a high risk situation if or when you get have a heretic stenosis. Not to say that you're gonna get heretic stenosis, but if you're healthy when you do, it makes recovery that much easier. It makes the procedure that much easier. And it, you, 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 hardly, you hardly miss a step, you know, coming in, getting the procedure done, and going home. I have patients who are, you know, very active in the late 60s or the 70s who came in, got the procedure, and they're back at work in a couple of days. They're not supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> but it just goes to show that, 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 that you know, in general, you know, um, uh, folks do well. Not to say that there are never bad things that happen, uh, but certainly the vast majority of folks are back and active, um, you know, in a really short period of time. But the best thing you can do is to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yes? I just have a comment. I told you that my sister had it done when she was 90. And it was before it was being done here, so she had it done at that was a trial. Okay. And uh, she died last year at the age of 96 and drove her car until she was 95. Yeah. And lived a very, very yes. fruitful and active life. That's wonderful. That That's great. Yeah, no, it works. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's an <laughs> Liz, do we have any questions online? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mangus, for a fascinating presentation. You learned so much. It was wonderful. Thank you, everyone here, for joining us here and those of you that are on Facebook Live. Um, and we hope that you will join us next month in October. Uh, October, we always dedicate to Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we are going to have a panel presentation on uh, how you can reduce your risks for breast cancer. Uh, and it will be led by Dr. Sharon Gutcher. So we'll see you next month. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.